Uh, my name is Kwaja. I am the VP of Engineering at AWS Elemental. Um, I am honored to be here talking alongside Julian, who is the Director for Digital Platforms at Digital Video Platforms at Discovery. He's been with Discovery for 11 years, worked across broadcast technology and digital platforms. And he's going to tell you a little bit about his perspective on how to bring live video to end consumers and how he really thinks about the customer experiences that you have to build and how to get them right. So we're going to be co-speaking and, and going back and forth between the two of us. Yep. Help me yep. welcome Julian on stage. Right, so when we start thinking about video and live video on the internet, we want to build a remarkable viewer experience. And what does that mean? A remarkable viewer experience means that it's available to your viewers at any of the devices that they want to see it on. It's not limited to a television screen or a particular type of mobile device or specific tablet. Viewers want to see the content anywhere. You've got to have the highest video quality for the bit rates that are available to the end customer. So regardless of what the end customer's bandwidth is, you've got to be able to maximize it and get the ultimate amount of quality in their eyes as you can. And it's not simple because the bandwidth is fluctuating, but you've got to optimize for that. You want to have minimal buffering. Nothing ruins a streaming experience like a spinning ball while you're waiting for buffer. And you want to have it uninterrupted, regardless of what fails upstream. So available anywhere, highest quality per bit, uninterrupted, and no buffering. The other thing that starts to matter when you're doing live sports is latency. You want to be able to get all of the information in front of the viewer's eyes as quickly as possible. Because what really, really sucks is if you're having a football viewing party at your house and your neighbors start cheering for the goal or the touchdown uh, before it's available on your screen. So latency starts to matter a lot. And when customers are designing for scale, they mean different things. For some of our customers, scale means having a live event with tens of millions of viewers. And everybody's going to be watching, can't be interrupted. It's just one super high value content. And everybody's going to be on it for three hours, and then it's going to be silent. To other customers, it means thousands of concurrent running channels. Lots going on, lots of choices available. There isn't really anything in particular that has lots of viewers. It's just you know there's some distribution around viewership, but it's not you know, super high, uh, high pressure, high viewership 24-7. Uh, to others, it means both. So there's other kinds of customers who have high viewer rates, super um, valuable live events, and then they're also concurrently running those thousands of channels. And being able to deliver that remarkable viewer experience at scale is difficult because it's a really scary world out there. Your player has bandwidth fluctuating. People are walking around on their phones. They're entering elevators or they're getting Wi-Fi signal drops. And, the, you know, and just even on the wired connections, you're getting the jitter and the bandwidth that can make it really likely for the player to buffer. You got to make sure that there's no infrastructure disruptions because hardware fails. And you want to make sure that even if hardware failed, it's completely imperceptible to the end viewer. And you got to make sure that your field network, where you're getting the live feed from, is reliably getting the data into the cloud. So we're going to go through some key techniques that we use in the Elemental Media Services to help get that remarkable viewer experience despite this scary world. So a typical live workflow, you get a set of cameras in the field. And through some network, you're getting that data into AWS. Uh, and that's where you're going to transcode it. And you're going to generate different types of bit rates that can conform to the various bandwidth that's available to your end viewers. After that, you've got a packager and origination service where you can do digital rights management, encryption, uh, packaging to support iOS-smooth devices, HLS-smooth devices, and so forth. 
and then you've got a CDN. Now it could be one CDN, it could be multiple CDN, um, and then at the end of that picture, and at the end of that bit journey is uh, the multiple OTT devices and your end viewers. And that's the end-to-end -end flow, so we're gonna go in it one step at a time. So if you narrow in on the contribution side, even the most reliable network that you might have at the field may experience some level of jitter um, as various events are happening on the internet. It could be congestion, it could be jitter due to a route flap, anything could be happening there and you wanna make sure that you are resilient to that. And the capability that we offered there is called Elemental Media Connect which uses advanced erasure coding techniques to send redundancy over these UDP bit, uh, bit streams to ensure that if there's some level of packet loss, which is happening inevitably, um, that you can recover it inside of AWS. And you, know, you can be resilient to that packet loss and still get the video in without having artifacts and blocked um, and choppiness and so forth on your video stream or missed frames for that matter. The other thing that Media Connect allows you to do is once the stream is reliably in or once your streams are reliably in, you can broadcast them to multiple end uh, devices. So you might be, you know, if you've got a super high value stream and you want to get it to lots of affiliates and they each are going to have their own encoding parameters and their own encoding profiles and different types of, you know, rights that they have, you can get the data in once rather than everybody trying to get it directly. You can get the data in once and then disseminate it to your um, end distributors. So network resilience, you know, we support the advanced erasure coding techniques include, you know, Zixi. We're also starting to look at other protocols uh, to provide more options there. So now the data stream, your live stream has made it into the encoder. And it's gonna decode that and it's gonna encode it across various bit rates. And when you provision a channel in Media Live, you've got the basic redundancy story where it's got you know, it's multiple AZs. When you provision a channel, you get infrastructure in two AZs. They're completely independent of each other, so you can fail on one of the encoder boxes or you can fail an entire data center, but you still have your stream going. That's super basic. The thing that we add on top of that is called output locking. So Live is producing, Elemental Media Live produces segmented video, and we want to make sure that the segment boundaries are aligned between the two encoders. And the reason for that is that if one of the encoders fails, and your player ends up switching to the output of another encoder, you don't want the player to go back a few frames or forward a few frames, and you want it to be just completely imperceptible to the end viewer. And by doing some minimal communication between these two encoders, we're able to make sure that these two encoders uh, rely, uh, are able to reconcile the segment boundary so that they are uniform. And it's turned on by default as long as you've got time code metadata into your, uh, in your input stream. So if you've got that, this is already enabled by default. You go right into the packaging and origination side, and again, we've got the basic multi-AZ story. Um, it runs across uh, at least three AZs in each region, and it's able to you know, fail over if there's any AZ level uh, issues or if there's any infrastructure level issues. And that's cool, um, but the other thing that, uh, that Media Package does is it's able to take the outputs of two encoders and reconcile them into a single output so that you don't have to uh, add any complexity to your end viewers and to your end players to do failovers, to deal with failovers on the live encoding side. So you get a stream, you get two streams in with time code, they go into Media Live, the segment boundaries are aligned, those two go into an elemental media packet channel and you get one output that is reconciled that your player can display and anything that happens is completely seamless on the encoder side. Then, to facilitate a multi-CDN workflow, you've got to have a scalable origin. You wanna make sure that when all the pops from, you know, when you get super popular and you've got pops hitting you from all over the world from multi-CDN, you're gonna to have to handle a pretty high uh, throughput rate. Now this is not a uh, substitution for a CDN, but uh, it's got enough capacity so that if you have lots of CDNs, each with their pops um, hammering the origin, uh, there's a caching layer built in that's able to absorb that load and support that multi-CDN workflow without crumbling under that load of multi-CDN. 
Now, last but not least, you get to the scariest part, which is the devices themselves. And in order to deal with the variability that exists between the, uh, uh, in the bandwidth that an end viewer has access to, the industry has been doing adaptive bit rates for a very long time where, you know, you've got uh, capped, uh, you know, you've got a constant bit rate and, you know, you've got a bouquet where you've got, you know, five megabits, two megabits, one megabit going down lower and lower. And you can have lots of steps in that ladder. But if the scene is simple, you're still going to use up all the same number of bits as if you would if the scene got super complex. And what this means is that in simple scenes, you end up wasting a lot of bits. And in complex scenes, you don't have access to those bits to be able to encode those complexities without um, introducing artifacts. So one of the things that we built was our uh, rate control, which is quality-defined variable bit rate control, which allows operators to specify a parameter to say, just express to us, how aggressive do you want us to be in taking advantage of the scene simplicity that comes in uh, over time. And based on that, so you're just defining the quality, and based on that tuning, we will take advantage of those dips that are coming in. And this particular capability has allowed some major customers to save up to 35% of their CDN costs at the highest bit rates because you've got, you know, if you have a football game, you've got, you know, slates, you've got ads, you've got transitions and fades where nothing really interesting is happening. You don't need a lot of bits for that. And more than just having the, you know, the CDN cost savings or the storage cost savings for VOD, and, um, and the ability to scale to more viewers because you're using up a, 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 a much lower, 35% or so lower bit rate uh, overall. The other thing that this enables you to do is to help you minimize the buffering on your end player. So if you put yourself in the shoes of a player, what is it trying to do? It's got one job other than playing the video, is to not buffer. So the player's working really hard, it's running on that treadmill and wants to keep that front buffer. And it's just, it wants to do whatever it can to not run out of that front buffer. And every once in a while when there's a bandwidth jitter, it'll run out, you know, that six second buffer might turn into a four second buffer, might turn into a two second buffer. And if all the player has access to is that bit rate, that bandwidth that your cap bit rate is at, it's never gonna actually be able to re, uh, regain, gain grounds on that particular uh, front buffer. With QBBR, with these specific dips that are happening and coming into the play, the player gets opportunities, these windows of opportunities where it can extend its front buffer when simple scenes come in, and that gives it some breathing room. It does two things. It minimizes the buffering on the player side, and two, it makes the highest bit rates available to a broader population of viewers, so you are able to get higher quality to the end viewers. It'll be hard to talk about um, you know, rate control and, uh, and encoding without talking about AV1. So the other things that we've been doing is uh, production support for AV1. AV1 is a new codec um, that is really helping us enhance the quality that we can get to the end viewer. So this, uh, this artifact's a little harder to see on the, uh, on the projector there, but what you see here is it's Mozart in the jungle at 720p at 376 kilobits per second with AVC on, uh, on the right side there. And if you look closely, what you're gonna see is like these choppy blocks. And the same bit rate with AV1, you're able to see a smooth play. And, and this becomes really, really pronounced when you are, um, you know, when there's dance scenes and you know, people are moving around and low light conditions and you know, pans. You see all kinds of artifacts at this particular super low bit rate for 720p. And those are just non-existent in the AV1 side. Now, the thing that is blocking AV1 right now from getting massive traction is just device support. If you start enabling a super high bit rate on your mobile phone uh, to watch the Super Bowl or to watch your favorite football game, you're gonna run out of battery very, very quickly. So we're waiting for hardware support, uh, but we're not, uh, for it to take off, but we're not staying still. We're, we're actively innovating on the AV1 spec integrating it with our rate control algorithms so that we can get the uh, highest quality per bit out to our end viewers. Um, 
if you want to see more pronounced versions of this the, uh, at the AWS booth, at the Elemental booth, uh, you can see some of these videos playing live and, and you'll see some of the choppiness for Mozart in the Jungle and, um, and a bunch of other content as well. And then there's ads. And not everybody loves ads. Uh, and, uh, but what's the worst thing is when you get an ad that is completely irrelevant to you. That means that's a wasted opportunity for the content owner to monetize that content, and it's just a waste of time for the end viewer. The other thing that happens in uh, the video ads is you get these client-side ad insertions that sometimes get choppy and you know, get blocked by ad blockers, or you got these terrible creatives that have been already rendered in, you know, with a completely different encoder, with different uh, parameters, and the viewer experience, like you, know, you go from um, a completely smooth game to some choppy video, or a video that's encoded um, at, the, um, uh, at the wrong bit rate or the wrong frame rate, and you get player crashes and so forth, and there's just, it's just not a good experience if the ads are not seamless. So one of the things that we have done here uh, in the Elemental Media Tailor service <laughs> is given our customers the ability to do personalized server-side ad insertion. So when you're one of the viewers watching Thursday Night Football on Prime Video, uh, or one of the millions of viewers concurrently watching it uh, on Thursday, the ad you're going to see is going to be different than the ad that your neighbor is going to see. Those ads are going to be more relevant to you. They're going to match the encoding parameters that, are, uh, uh, that is aligned with the main content. And what, uh, the way this works is customers bring us their ADS and they say, hey, they bring us ADS and they bring a decorated stream with ad markers. So when we see a SCUDI 35 ad marker in the stream, we go to the ADS, pass in um, you know, whatever piece of information you want us to pass, and we ask the ADS, hey, I've got a 90 second pod, give me some ads. When that comes back, we look in our cache to see if we've got that creative already transcoded with the parameters that are aligned with the stream. And if so, we're able to just manipulate the manifest and inject those um, ads that are personalized for that end viewer. If they're not already transcoded to match the encoding parameters, we enqueue a just-in-time transcoding job so that we can inject it quickly. And if it doesn't finish, it's okay. We will do it the next time, and we have enriched our cache. But at the same time, most of the uh, ads that are playing are super relevant to the end viewer, and they're actionable, which means better experience for the end viewer and more monetization for the content owners. Going back to latency, I. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about latency in sports. Uh, if you ever are trying to watch a demo on low latency and you find yourself going back and forth between the times and seeing, hey, which, how far off are they, uh, the easiest thing to do is to just take a picture. And uh, so what this picture is showing you is a, uh, you know, a clock running uh, uh, at a show. Uh, that's being captured by a camera that feeds into a Videon encoder uh, that gets published over to Elemental Media Store and gets uh, delivered to a laptop that is sitting right there over CloudFront. And you'll see here the end-to-end -end latency is a little less than three seconds. And the way we make that happen, so if you go back to that player who's trying to maintain that front buffer, we inherently give that player a big disadvantage by having it download chunked video and the, uh, or segmented video. And the reason is that if you've got a six second segment with you know, Dash or HLS, um, until that entire six second segment is produced and written from the encoder, the player doesn't know about it and the player is not downloading it. And that's wasted time. And what we did in Media Store, uh, working very closely with our partners at Videon, was we started enabling support for chunk CMAF encoding. And what that does is as the segment is being written, that segment is available for download. So the encoder will signal a uh, speculative manifest and say, hey, I'm about to start writing this particular segment. It may not be there yet, but you know, hey, player, start downloading this. And as the player goes to Media Store and says, hey, I need this particular segment, Media Store will start streaming that segment as it's being written. And that gives that player that 
massive advantage so that it's not waiting for that full segment to be written. And it allows you to have really large segment sizes without compromising uh, latency, which then helps you with the highest uh, uh, quality per bit. Now, it's fun in games to show this uh, at a demo at a conference, and uh, maybe it doesn't really work for production, but that's not the case. We had a, we were very fortunate uh, to participate in a, uh, one of the first, uh, or maybe the, the first production use of a large live event with ultra low latency. Uh, this was with Fuji TV with the uh, Volleyball World Cup. Uh, got lots of viewers. And the workflow is super simple. You got cameras connecting to a Videon Edgecaster, which is doing that chunk CMAF encoding. Uh, it takes that stream. Uh, those segments over AWS Direct Connect to Elemental Media Store. Media Store makes those segments available, and you get delivered. You get those segments delivered via CloudFront as they're being written. And your end viewers in this particular volleyball game are enjoying, uh, you know, uh, roughly the three-second glass-to-glass latency, which is pretty revolutionary if you compare that to the broadcast experience today when you watch football, for instance, in the states. And it's super easy. Um, the player here is the visual on player. Super easy to configure. Um, you just turn ultra low latency on and uh, point it to the media store uh, part and go. All right, with that, uh, with that brief overview and, uh, of elemental media services, I'm going to turn it over to Julian uh, to start talking a little bit about how this stuff is coming into play in Discovery's endeavors. Thank you, Kawaja. Thanks. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm just going to take you through today uh, a couple of examples of products uh, that we've leveraged this uh, AWS Media Services platform uh, to deliver two very different types of channel uh, at the scale that Kawaja was talking about. Um, but let me just talk to you a little bit about Discovery. Uh, if you don't know about Discovery, Discovery is a uh, leading, uh, global leading uh, provider of real life entertainment. We produce over 8,000 hours of original content every year and um, also on our European sports platform, Eurosport, uh, we can have up to 150 hours of uh, live uh, events being streamed during a day for some events like tennis and uh, we can be streaming up to 1,500 hours of linear and live events during a day as well. So we have a considerable amount of content that we can provide to our consumers. Um, the idea here is that we want to reuse that content uh, over and over again to multiple direct-to-consumer platforms. And essentially, that is our opportunity. We want to create the best-in-class direct-to-consumer uh, applications and platforms and to do that, we need a video processing pipeline that's efficient, scalable, and has the quality we want our consumers to view our content with. So I'm going to take you through a couple of examples of uh, two applications we have. And uh, both of these are in production. They're live. We have consumers on them uh, consuming our content. Uh, the first is Food Network Kitchen. Um, this one scales because of the number of sources that we need to pick up and deliver to our live Food Network Kitchen channel. We have 10 classes a day, seven days a week, where we have live chefs and uh, celebrities on the camera live cooking for people. And that has its own uh, uh, complications in terms of getting sources back to and into the cloud so we can encode them and put them up uh, to our application. But this does mean that with this uh, new platform that we have in-house built on AWS Media Services, we have that glass-to-glass -glass control now, which previously we did not. As I said, we have studio remote production sites around the US. We leverage uh, Amazon Alexa control for interaction with uh, users, which is why we have the live channels. So you can actually speak to our live chefs um, and ask them questions, which they answer. We're also leveraging Fire TV and Echo Show as well, so people can actually be using this in their kitchens and actually be cooking along with this. 
And the really cool thing about this uh, video flow, we were able to produce this in 10 weeks. From the initial idea of going, we want a live show, to getting it to our first beta users was 10 weeks. And it was uh, a, quite an amazing feat. So I've got uh, just a little bit of a sizzle reel here, which gives you a sort of a flavor of what we're doing. We all love food. And we're cooking more than ever. We just don't always love doing it. Now, how would you like to experience the joy and convenience of cooking with the best chefs in the world right in your own kitchen? Alexa, show me a cooking class from Bobby Flay. Hey, it's Bobby Flay, and together we're going to turn your kitchen into a Food Network kitchen. Introducing Food Network Kitchen, a first-of-its-kind app offering live and on-demand classes with culinary experts from around the world. Thank you for cooking with me. From Food Network, the most trusted name in culinary entertainment. Your favorite chefs live every day with 25 live interactive classes each week and hundreds of on-demand classes updated daily. Ask Martha, Giada, Bobby, or Guy live questions from your kitchen. How much salt do I need? A lot of salt. The most authentic and iconic chefs in the world are now available in your kitchen as trusted friends. Follow along and cook with me. Fueled by the voice of Alexa, the power of Fire Tablets and Fire TV, and the hands-free magic of the Echo Show. You will be a rock star if you make this. With ingredient lists at your fingertips and simple touch grocery delivery. Get everything you need to cook in real time with the masters. Now, let's mix up the batter. A smart, extra set of hands that will build your confidence and bring joy back to cooking. Because if we can eat it, we can make it together. Food Network Kitchen, the live platform for the so kitchen As you can see there, some of the complexities now around some of the devices that we have that live channel with. Uh, some of them landscapes, some of them portraits. You know, it was quite a complex sort of video chain that we needed to provide for. But um, that's what uh, media services um, allowed us to leverage. Um, the other example that I'll take you through today is uh, Eurosport. Um, this is scale at a completely different uh, level. So this is the number of channels. We have 52 markets across Europe that we deliver to. Uh, we have both simulcast channels, which is essentially live event, uh, uh, sorry, uh, live uh, simulcast channels and live event channels. Uh, we have over 33 simulcast channels, 55 live event channels. So we're talking uh, about 87 odd uh, channels in the cloud. Uh, some of those are 24-7. Uh, some of those are literally only up uh, when we have uh, live events. So it means we need to have the complexity of being able to turn these down and up so we're not using uh, compute when we don't need to. Um, once again, uh, this really enabled us to have end-to-end -end, uh, delivery from our contribution feed to our customer, uh, which we previously didn't have. So we now have that control over quality. Like I said, we are streaming up to 1,500 hours a day across this platform. Um, We've uh, been able to leverage some of the features within Media Packager to enable us now to have event-long DVR windows. So when you come into it and you're in the middle of the game, you can scrub back all the way to the beginning. And this also includes some of our longer events, uh, which are up to six or seven hours. You can come in and scrub all the way back to the beginning if you want to, which is a fantastic feature. Uh, we also were able to leverage the media packager as well to create automated live to VOD processes, uh, which used to take several hours. Uh, literally, it's now just taking minutes. In our first month, we had over 6 million views on this platform. And this whole platform just took us six months to, uh, from the beginning of the planning stages all the way to delivery to live production. So here's a quick sizzle reel of... If what you call a passion, others call an obsession. Every game, every angle, every second. If you want to stream, anytime, anywhere. Download the app for 24-7 sport madness on Eurosport Player. Subscribe now. 
And uh, this platform, um, some of you may know, but Discovery has the rights in Europe to the Olympics and often known as one of the biggest sporting events in the world. But essentially, we are going to be leveraging this platform to add another 65 channels for the Olympics. And the plan is to stream every single sec second of the Olympics. And 45 of those channels are due to be in UHD. So we're going to be leveraging this platform to do that. So um, with, with those particular opportunities uh, of those products, um, the video distribution platform, when we started and started to think about what, what uh, features, well, what applications we could use to help with us to create this single pipeline to take all of our great content from our uh, world-class broadcast platform and get it direct to consumers, we wanted to create this one single workflow. And we use the same workflow for both Eurosport and for Food Network Kitchen. It uses the same components so we can keep leveraging and grow and pull down channels as and when we need them. As I said, Eurosport Player, we delivered the 87 streaming channels. And for the Food Network, it was producing that channel that had multiple sources and real complex devices that we had to deliver to. So some of the core technologies that we deployed uh, to enable this, we had our metadata aggregator, which was a single DB, DynamoDB within AWS. Essentially, this pulled together all of our assets and events. Okay, so um, uh, live events uh, for sports, essentially it's a standard linear or event schedule that we have in our scheduling system. We pull that through into our metadata aggregator, so we have all the event information and pictures associated with that event uh, that we could pull together and start leveraging our platform from that point. Uh, we have advanced erasure coding techniques to ensure that we reliably get all of our mezzanine streams for live events up into the cloud, um, making sure that uh, both they are secure um, and also that they don't have any packet loss. So we're starting from the best possible starting point within our cloud infrastructure. Um, and they went uh, obviously up uh, to AWS Media Connect, which is the start point for workflows. Once we have it up into the AWS Media pipeline, uh, obviously go through our encoding uh, and source switching via Media Live. Um, then Media Package, which is creating multiple formats. We're supporting HLS, Dash, and Smooth uh, for the, the Eurosport. Uh, on Food Network Kitchen, it's just HLS. Um, it enables us to get those instantaneous full event replays, which I sort of spoke about uh, through the Media Packager. We harvest the segments that are created by the Media Packager to ensure that we can deliver the uh, full DVR window up to 14 hours and our full event replays up to 14 hours uh, long. Uh, we can't quite do the 24 hours of Le Mans yet, but uh, there'll be at some point in the future that I'm sure we'll get to that. We have encryption on all of our channels um, and event-based DRM. So essentially, uh, by event, we can turn on DRM. So a single stream uh, might have multiple events during the day, but we don't want to DRM all of them. We can do this with this new platform with a speaking interface uh, that AWS has. Um, and we developed a live event manager as well, because um, it's all very well having all these lovely cloud uh, channels, uh, but you need to control them. Uh, we have something called the Live Event Manager, which is a hit in-house system, which enables us to start and stop the channel. So when we don't need it, we can turn it down so it's not costing us money. And it also enables us to do slating, um, add bugs, graphics, other things we might want to do once the stream is in the cloud. Um, obviously, to protect our origin, uh, we have an origin shield. Uh, so it caches our uh, segments uh, for uh, efficient use of our multi-CDN network. Uh, we use multi-CDNs to ensure resiliency and to improve uh, as much as possible that last mile delivery to the consumer to improve the quality. So um, I can sort of take you through into a little bit deeper into the technology that we're using and uh, the high-level architecture here. Um, so VDP essentially is inside the dotted box 
and it has two core components. The first is our asset, asset catalog. Essentially, we aggregate all our EPG uh, schedules and uh, asset for, for VOD assets into our asset uh, database. Essentially, this is then our heart room of driving two things. It drives our front end, so we onward deliver the metadata to our CMS layer, and that then is shown on the UI layer. And the same asset uh, can also then drive the video pipeline um, and with some of the key APIs that we have written uh, to drive that. Some of the key APIs that we have is a live provisioning API. Um, that enables us to create a fully region redundant channel with a single call to a single API. I, the next slide will start going into what a channel looks like at a slightly deeper level, but essentially we can generate that at a click of a button. And that means when Food Network came to us about three months into this project, we literally stood up a cloud channel for them within 30 minutes. And literally we gave them the IP addresses of the Media Connect and said, here you are, put your sources into here. We gave them the origin URL and literally within two hours they had a piece of content on their app through the cloud. And they were going, well, I thought we were going to have to wait several months for this, but literally they were up and working within a, a day. Um, we have uh, the live management API, uh, like I said, which enables us to control the, uh, uh, the channels in the cloud. Like I said, adding slates to them, turning them up and down as and when we need to. We have our video assets uh, API. Essentially, this is where we store all of our asset IDs and which stream uh, that asset will be played on. What this means is because we're keeping that information at uh, the core level, it means that if we need to change the channel that a live event might be on, literally we can make that change and literally in two or three seconds, that information will be there and available, and so when a user clicks on it, they'll get to the right stream. Okay, so that's a really powerful thing that uh, we can leverage. And the other one there we have is our video playback API. This is a public-facing API, which generates the URL needed to get to the correct content. Uh, we have tokenized, um, so there's a time bond token on there, um, so it's only available for 30 seconds or so. Um, we have lots of other uh, uh, parameters within that URL to ensure that the URL is personalized and the user gets the best possible performance. Um, the green box essentially then, therefore, is the video flows. Okay, so this is where we take our broadcast level mezzanine file uh, from our uh, broadcast network into the cloud. We take it through Media Connect media uh, live and their media package, um, and then that goes on to our CDNs. So um, I'm just going to take you through now a single channel. So what you see here is a single channel in the cloud, okay? Um, so it all starts in the top left of our box there, which is in the Discovery uh, WAN network. We are leveraging our broadcast, world-class uh, broadcast uh, network, uh, that we've obviously developed for our standard linear channels, and we're leveraging that same, uh, same network and uh, the same uh, quality we get from that to uh, put uh, the content feeds onto the, uh, into the cloud. Um, so we have a reserve encoder and a main encoder. They're cross-connected uh, via two uh, separate colo locations within our WAN, uh, which means that into a single region, we get a main and reserve feed. And to Akwaja's point earlier on about the parallel stream within a uh, region, essentially we are maximizing the possibility that whatever fails within our network will not cause an outage to our user. So we can lose any point, whether it might be a main encoder, whether it might be one of our colos, but essentially the user won't see a drop in the stream because of the, uh, the combined uh, origin from a two encoding stream within a region. We have 
a direct copy of that in a separate region, so we do have regional failover, okay? And that's really important for some of our big events and some of our high value uh, uh, channels. Um, once we get into um, the cloud uh, using our Direct Connect uh, connections, um, we have Media Connect. Media Connect is our primary sourcing switching if we want to take multiple feeds into a single channel, which we can do. Um, and essentially, that then pushes on to Media Live. Media Live, uh, we are essentially creating all of our renditions that we need uh, and all the bit rates that we want to cover for each of our different channels. By channel, we can decide what that might be. Um, so we can really leverage what we want to push out to our end uh, devices. Um, just a little bit about the failover between uh, regions. Uh, while in region, the failover is uh, unperceptible to the user. If we do need to fail over regions, the user will have to see a disruption in their uh, pipeline, because essentially they will need a different URL. So essentially, if a user is seeing a black screen or uh, a poor screen for a long time, and they refresh, and we've done the switch of the regions, then they'll get the new URL and they'll get onto the other region. At the moment, both of our regions run hot, so they all have live feeds going through them, uh, which is really good for resiliency. But further on, we might be looking at going to some cold regions, so we're not burning so much cost for those channels or events that aren't quite so high profile. Our media packager um, essentially is picking up those uh, renditions and creating our dash uh, HLS and smooth uh, uh, endpoints. Um, and also we have separate uh, endpoints for DRM content. So essentially, as I said before, it's intelligent enough and every time a user asks for a URL, they'll be either provided a DRM one if the event is DRM'd or just an encrypted endpoint um, if it's just a standard uh, uh, event. Um, we then push that to our origin shield. Uh, that's our caching layer. Uh, which reduces our uh, cost of uh, egress from AWS. And that's then pushed to our multi-CDN platform. Uh, we have a combination of ways to control um, what CDNs uh, users get, um, both from a, business uh, from a business switching point of view, just by saying um, uh, which one is the most cost efficient, but also we can leverage our video monitoring software on our client side to potentially pick up issues with certain CDNs and we can actually take CDNs completely out of the work stream. So um, I'll flip between the two here just to sort of state the point that even between Eurosport and Food Network, the only thing that you will ch see changed is the regions that these are deploy deployed on. So uh, Eurosport is obviously in Europe, so we're using Euros uh, European AWS uh, regions. And in the US, we're using US regions, because obviously we want our origin endpoints as close to the users as possible. Um, I just want to take you through um, some of our uh, really cool technology that we've deployed to leverage the media package segment. Um, Storage, so media package as standard stores 14 days worth of segments, okay, uh, in your live stream. So that means that it's uh, uh, essentially a, a sort of a, a mine of really useful information you can leverage for different workflows. So our events go through essentially four statuses uh, for the end user. The first is scheduled, so this is an event that's due to start in the future. And essentially, it's just a piece of metadata that a user sees on the front end screen. Once it's live, the live then can get to a URL onto our origin endpoint, and it just has the feed of segments as and when they get generated. So users are seeing them live. Within that live status, the user can also scrub back to the beginning of the event, like I said, using all those segments in the packager. 
The next step, the next status is really the, the first one that we've leveraged to really enhance the features for our users. It's the ability to create and provide the user a full event replay of what has just finished literally a second after the event has finished. So the event on the user screen literally just changes from a live tag to a full event replay tag. Then the user, instead of getting the live feed URL with a start time but no end time, they will get a URL with a start and end time, but to the origin of the live feed, picking up the segments that are already in the origin, uh, so already in the media package. And that is a really, really great feature that we've been able to leverage. The next thing is that many of you may know, but live events never, never run to schedule. Start time often changes, and certainly the end time is never the scheduled end time. So uh, the workflow allows our editors to go in and update the actual start time and actual finish time. So the actual start time and actual finish time, and that generates a workflow that goes away and picks up all the segments from our harvested segments and generates uh, a piece of VOD which is accurate um, and doesn't have lots of ads at the beginning and cuts off the action just, to, just when you're, it's all about just to kick off and really get interesting. So that's a really powerful feature that we've also leveraged within this harvesting uh, and live to VOD workflow. As we all know, um, having all these great AWS uh, uh, services to leverage, getting it to production is another thing. And one of the key things that we said right at the beginning is we want to ensure that this is production ready and can be serviced. So um, we did several things. Number one, we ensured we had monitoring operational consoles that were uh, uh, really useful um, and um, could have active resolutions to common issues that we see on these streaming platforms. And secondly, we leveraged our 24-7 broadcast operations teams and essentially leveraged them to be digital operations teams. And so we used all of that great infrastructure we already had and just enabled them by having the right tools to do stuff. So the, operation, the operations team don't have to rely on developers or even DevOps to do things like CDN switching, uh, changing the security level of the URL if we have any issues with DRM or encryption, it enables them to start and stop channel components. Um, we make sure that they're able to do the manual switch of regions if we have an issue within a region. And we're able to do this to, to ensure that they have the right monitoring tools because we use uh, Amazon CloudWatch and MSAM's monitoring tools, um, which pushes to some of our alerting platforms that we have uh, in the enterprise. And obviously, we have our video metrics monitoring as well for our, our client side. I'm just going to take you through a few screens um, to show some of the operating consoles here, which enables the operations team to uh, really have uh, direct control of our uh, cloud channels. Um, for instance, this one here on the bottom right enables an operator to see both the uh, uh, primary origin and the secondary origin to ensure that we're seeing the same thing. Um, and if there's a breakage, there'll be an alert and it'll be very clear to the operator that one of the origins is down and that they may have to switch. This is our MSAM tile monitor, which is standard within AWS. Um, each of these tiles, essentially there are multiple AWS components that sit under a single tile. Um, so this enables us to quickly see uh, by channel which ones might have a problem. Some of these alerts, some of these channels, as you can see, are in green, uh, which are fine, some of them in red. Some of the red ones I can see are actually our live event channels, and the reason they're red is because they're turned down and they're not actually being used at the moment. Um, this is uh, when you click in an M into an MSAM tool, this is uh, something that you would see, and it shows you all the core components of uh, cloud uh, channel. 
So the very top, you can see the media connects, and the two media connects for a single region come into uh, a single source. Um, the sources across there might be um, slates, they might be graphics, they might be other actual live feeds. You can see them all pointing to a single media live, um, although there is obviously then the, within the media live, there is the two separate video workflows, so there's two encoders within that media live. The reason it's red, because it's turned down, because uh, it's a live event feed. That passes on to our media packager, which is the single blue icon, and you can see all of our uh, origin endpoints that we're creating for all of our different formats. Um, we obviously take all of the CloudWatch data, we put it into um, uh, vendors, uh, platforms like we have, like Splunk, etc., and we pull them out uh, through things like New Relic, Datadog, etc., to provide monitoring tools so we can um, make sure that uh, we're keeping an eye on our APIs. And we obviously have uh, video metrics monitoring as well, uh, where we can see what's actually happening to the consumer itself. So. Um, just quickly going through, so the successes of uh, discovery and using the AWS media services platforms, we created a full Eurosport player um, uh, workflow in six months, um, which was, um, you know, we thought was super quick to meet some very, very aggressive deadlines. Food Network Kitchen, we developed in 10 weeks and delivered that platform, um, and both of these are in productions. Like I said, full event replays, live to VOD, Segment harvesting, all features which have been incredible um, improvements on our previous uh, OTT uh, deliverables. Um, encryption and DR, an event-based DRM is a great feature that we've been able to add as uh, fairly standard with a speaky interface. And the event channel management, being able to schedule slating, starting, stopping digital channels, etc. Lessons learned. Um, I won't sit, stand up and tell you that this was all beautifully done in, without any issues at all, but uh, AWS uh, provided us uh, an event team, so they were super responsive to any issues that we had uh, that we need to get resolved. Um, uh, some of the things that you need to be aware of, um, Media Connect does need to be kept open all the time uh, with the connection to our uh, sort of Zixis on-prem. The reason for that is that if you turn Media Connect down, the IP address that you had will be lost. And obviously, you want IP to IP address with your unicast uh, delivery up to the cloud. So that's one of the things that we did find that uh, uh, we, 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 sort of, uh, we were a little bit compromised on ideally what we wanted to do. Um, redundant regions need to be manually failed over. Um, they are not synced. And there's no way to create a sync at the moment uh, through, through regions. So you will have a breaking consumer uh, experience. Um, we did have intermittent packet loss, which is very hard to monitor within the AWS uh, media services stream. You know, there's not lots of uh, complex networking that happens within the AWS infrastructure. And noticing those packet lots is very difficult. I, did need to take my hats off to AWS. They were very quick to look at their infrastructure and actually change out some of their routing uh, and some of their components to improve that. But once again, it's something you need to monitor uh, on your players. Um, so you're ensuring that maybe you might need to fail over which media live route you're using within a region. And uh, with our playback APIs, we did choose Lambda originally, or uh, we are using Lambda. That has its scaling challenges. We need to pre-warm or keep warm the lambdas uh, to ensure that they're nice and responsive. And if we need to scale up that, um, you know, we need to manually warm up to the levels that we think that we need to cover. Um, we are looking at other options like containers, et cetera, to maybe uh, change that infrastructure a little bit. Um, future plans, now we have this great platform this stable platform, it's been in production now a couple of months, working really, really well. We can really start leveraging some of the things that Kwaja sort of said at the beginning of the presentation. Server-side ad insertion is something that we'll be doing very soon. Low latency, because it's uh, for, especially for the sports and even for Food Network, 
is a really big thing that we want to try and leverage. So we'll be leveraging that, uh, that very soon. UHD content is big for the Olympics, so we'll be bringing that on stream very soon. VOD stitching to generate virtual linear channels rather than putting uh, simulcast channels up there so we're not re-encoding stuff that we've already encoded once before. And some of the machine learning to increase the user experience both on the ad side but also in some of the personalization of channels, etc. So that's where I'm. Thank you, Quad. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Julian. So we'll be wrapping this up, but just a quick recap. Again, remarkable viewer experience comes with getting the data on all the devices that customers have access to. As you saw in the sizzle reel, the first sizzle reel that Julian showed, there's an explosion of devices. And you want to be able to get your content and take advantage of the interactivity that some of those devices are offering. And the speed of innovation that you get from building on top of the building blocks that are available in AWS, anything from the media-specific building blocks, as well as Lambda, the SQS, DynamoDB, and so forth, have enabled Discovery to put together these work, these really complex but really nice workflows in rapid manner. So we talked about, you know, I, I'm just going to repeat that, you know, six months from idea to execution on the Discovery channels, going to a full in-house team and getting these things operational, and then repeating that took only 10 weeks. And the next time you do it, it'll probably be yeah. much shorter than that. Um, with that, there's a bunch of other related uh, sessions. The, uh, you know, the only one that's left now is the, the last one on that list, uh, but the other ones are available online. You can uh, see the videos of them. But there's a media industry news from AWS tomorrow from 4 to 5 um, as well. Please remember to uh, take the survey, and thank you so much for uh, coming and listening to us.